Hi, everybody, and thank you all for being here with us this evening. If you're joining from the Northeast, hopefully you've got your feet up with a drink in hand and a clear driveway outside the window. Tonight's program is one that I have been counting down to for a pretty decent chunk of this year. Uh, it's kind of like a, an advent calendar for horror fans. Uh, but before we start the show, uh, just a quick note. If you've got a question for Chris, Jonathan, or John, please put it in the Ask a Question feature right below my giant head. Uh, we'll do our best to get to it tonight, So, and we want to hear from you guys, so please do drop comments there. Uh, and now let's get on with the show. It is uh, my great honor to introduce our moderator tonight, award-winning author, president of the Horror Writers Association, and most importantly, my friend, John Palisano. John has a bunch of books available right now, including Dust of the Dead, Ghost Heart, Nerve, Starlight Drive, Four Halloween Tales, and his first short fiction collection, All That Withers. John won the Bram Stoker Award in short fiction in 2016 for Happy Joe's Rest Stop. More short stories have appeared in anthologies from all of your favorites like Cemetery Dance, Weird Tales, Space and Time, Crystal Lake, Lovecraft, E-Zine, and so many more. John is always up for whatever we ask of him, and he and the HWA are huge supporters of our annual literary festival uh, that's in celebration of genre, Story Fest, which is ready to return, hopefully in person, in October 2021. So for all of that, we thank him. And with that, please, everybody, join me in welcoming John Palisano. Hi. Yay. Cue applause. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here on Thriller Night. I'm really excited. And um, thank you, Alex and the Westport Library for putting this on. And we have with us tonight Jonathan Mayberry and Christopher Golden. Um, if you're not familiar with them, which you might, you probably already are, um, Jonathan Mayberry is a New York Times bestselling and five-time Bram Stoker award-winning author, anthology editor, comic book writer, magazine feature writer, playwright, content creator, and writing teacher and lecturer. He was named one of today's top 10 horror writers. His books have been sold to more than two dozen countries. Cool. And we have Christopher Golden um, is the award-winning best-selling author of such novels as The Myth Hunters, Wildwood Road, The Boys Are Back in Town, The Ferryman, Strange Wood of, of Saints and Shadows, and with Tim Levin, The Map of Moments. He's also written books for teens and young adults, including Poison Ink, Solace, and the Thriller series Body of Evidence. Honored by the New York Public Library and chosen as one of YALSA's best books for young readers. His original novels have been published in 14 languages and countries around the world. Welcome. Hello. Oh, hey, how are you? How are you guys doing? Um, Good. Thanks for doing this, John. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. You know, Thank I just want to too. start by saying, let me let me start by saying, I feel like with Jonathan on in California and me in Massachusetts and what Jonathan is wearing and what I'm wearing, <laughs> Uh, I feel like we are heat miser and snow miser here. <laughs> the holiday, like there's something happening here with that. We are. Yeah, it's, yeah uh, totally. Yeah, and my, my, you know, I do have sympathy for all of my friends in the Northeast who are snowed in, <laughs> but this is why I moved to California from Pennsylvania. I'm just saying. You know, uh, listen, not the when you get around to June and it's 118 degrees, then that's the reason I'm here. Not not in San Diego. Right. <laughs> that's a sweet spot. We, we rarely get above, get above 80. I'm just saying. So. That's, I'm with you. I'm a, a transplant from the East Coast, too. I grew up really close to the Westport Library, literally a town away in Norwalk, Connecticut. So I feel the pain of, I, I don't think I've heard of a, a storm like this since maybe 78 that's hit the East Coast. Yeah. So my, my heart is with y'all, but um, we have the wildfires. I, I would trade the snow for the wildfires any day. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so I have some, some questions. Um, um, both of you have some great new books out. Um, Christopher's latest is, is I'll try to do this. If you can see it, red hands, which just came out, which is terrific. And Jonathan's ink just came out as well. I don't know if you could see, see that but yeah. there's nice graphics on the site anyway so my my first question is um even though either uh, of these books can be read as standalone novels uh, both ink and red hands are set in worlds and or with characters that have previously been established by the authors um pine deep for jonathan and ben walker uh, for christopher how important is it to you as an author to return to these places and characters chris you know, Jonathan, I usually, you usually go first. So, um, how important is it? You know, 
I always say when 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 talking about this topic, I always uh, bring up the fact that you know I grew up as a kid of television and comics. I love movies, obviously, um, but uh, you know, but I watched a ton of TV as a kid, and I read a lot of comics as a kid, and so to me, the idea that worlds and characters continue on just seemed very natural. So while lots of the books that I've written, um, you know, Snow Blind, The Boys Are Back in Town, have been standalones um, and don't feel like they require me to go back to them, a lot of things I do just feel like naturally, of course, this is a bigger world that has characters that will cross over and encounter one another. Uh, even when I was writing Ararat, I didn't, I wasn't thinking Ben Walker was going to be the, the, the connective tissue to other books, but I knew that the world that I was writing it in was not going to be, it wasn't going to be the only book that I wrote in that world. Yeah. I, I'm kind of the, the same way, you know, same influence as books and uh, books, comics and, and TV, because I like the in-depth character development. The characters were always more important to me than whatever the, the, the mega, you know, story element was going to be for any individual episode. Um, my, my, the thing about, about using um, characters in different stories and crossovers and so on wasn't something I, I set out to do when I wrote uh, my first novel, Ghost Road Blues. But a year later, I, I ran into Stephen King at the Edgar Awards in New York and uh, got talked to him and his wife for quite a while. And he actually recommended that I do this because he was doing it in his a lot of his books, like characters from Salem's Lot Show Up and the Dark Tower books and so on. And he said that fans dig it. And it's fun. He said it's very liberating uh, creatively when, when you realize that all of your stories take place in the weird universe that is inside your head. So he huh. recommended I give it a shot. And, you know, I was just a newbie, newly minted uh, novelist. And I'm thinking, well, if Stephen King is going to give me advice like that, let me consider it seriously. And then I found out how much fun it actually was. And there are very few projects I write that don't have some hint of the other stories but you know, one of the things, like 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 in 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 Ink, the story is set in a town in in my fictional town of Pine Deep, the location for my first three novels. But it doesn't require that you read those first three novels. So it, it, it's liberating to have a dairy or a Castle Rock or some place where you can go and just you know the setting is going to inspire a certain level of creepiness in your own writing. So you're very much at home there. And the same is with characters. You know, Ben Walker is a character you can throw into any situation. Um, my Monk Addison is a character I can throw into any situation, and the story will be richer for them being in it and a little, little more fun to write. And that's, I mean, that's definitely what I have fun doing with it. And, and, and again, so technically they're calling this a series of books, and it is a series in the sense that there are three of them. And, and Ben Walker does evolve from book to book, but... Ideally, like you, you can pick up any book, you know, any one of these books and not have to read them in order. They're standalone novels. But exactly what you said, Jonathan, what I love is like whatever book Ben Walker appears in next at some point, it's going to be who he is at the end of Red Hands. It's like nobody's ever met this character before, but that's who he is. And and he and I and I love like with Red Hands, I had the idea and then I thought, what would happen if I took Ben Walker and and he basically walked into this idea and um and that made the thing come alive yeah pretty cool and i i think that um readers love that too they love finding like the little easter eggs and and making those connections um i i love reading like the dark tower series because it kind of drew so many other um um tenants from all of other king uh, works so it's really it's really cool to see and i saw in you know the ghost road blues trilogy you did that a lot and um having read erita and and uh, pandora i saw a couple of things in there i was like oh that's pretty cool you know but you expertly kind of like summed some of that up so it was like for those who read it it was neat but you didn't have to this well really also cool. i think people don't really people don't realize this but uh if they if they are interested, track down my novel, The Ocean Dark, because it's the same world, yeah. and some characters in the, in Red Hands appear in The Ocean Dark as well. Uh -huh. um, but that was not published by Saint Martin, so um, <laughs> it, it, it's not publicized as being connected. 
Well, you know, it's a funny thing about that too, because you know, my ink novel is, is the same world as my. It, it's in the same publisher as my Joe Ledger novels and my Dead of Night novels, but they are still connected. But they're also connected to the stuff I do for Simon and Schuster. My YA stuff is an extension of some of the books I've written for St. Martin's. My editor's okay with it. I mean, yeah, they're not going to publicize it, but they are okay with it because that there's a potential for crossover audiences. Because if you write for different publishers, they may be a similar audience, but they're not exactly the same. And the cross-pollination right. is, is a lot of fun for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we, we do have a question um, about that too. Um, somebody named uh, Joel Burkat is asking, Jonathan, what's the main difference when you write YA? versus um i guess yeah well I both can answer that because chris and i both write ya but for me yeah. there's there isn't a lot of difference with my ya my adult fiction i mean yes i'm less potty mouth than my ya there's no <laughs> explicit sex in my ya um but in terms of, of plot complexity in terms of the edgy themes i don't pull any punches in my ya i mean my my latest ya broken lands came out and there was i mean there's a lot of stuff in there that's really edgy stuff and also very dark and very complex, but, but, um, and I'm sure Chris will agree with this. I actually respect the intelligence of, of teenagers. I know, you know, I remember when, when I was a kid, what I read, there wasn't a lot of YA back then. There was, you know, we had books written for adults that I was reading. I was reading the Godfather and Ed McBain and stuff like that when I was in middle school. So I know we could handle it. If it's too much kids self censor. So, when I write for kids, I don't write down to them. If anything, I tend to write up. Um, but I, I do change a little bit of, of the verbiage because, you know, I don't feel like having to defend every expletive all through a YA novel. I've done that a couple of times. Hmm. Um, but thematically, um, I, probably the only real difference is the fact that the protagonist is solidly a teenager in my YA, whereas an adult, there may be teens, but they're supporting characters. Right. Yeah, I haven't written YA in years, um, but uh, the one that springs to mind for me is I did a zombie novel called Soulless, and um, and boy, I mean, Soulless is like the least. It might be. It's certainly one of the nastiest things I've ever written, and it was written oh. for teenagers. So I don't, you know, I don't yeah. think there's a, you know, for me it is. It's about, you know, what are the what is the age of your protagonists? Uh, what are the you know experiences that they're going through the the themes of their life at that time you know um yeah i mean th those are sort of the focus and i just want, want to throw one other thing in there there is a, a bit more of a significant difference between the adult fiction and middle grade fiction uh, mm -hmm. which is the tear down you know third fourth fifth sixth grade those stories tend to you know they don't have romance in them um because nobody wants to write or read about fourth graders having you know love love relationships um, there, there's usually not the ensemble cast that I have in most of my novels. It tends to be single character focus, you know, uh, and the language is very much tamer in middle grade. But, uh, th so that's a more extreme difference, be be uh, between that and my YA, uh, my, um, adult than my YA is, which is not that much softened. Cool. Very interesting. Um, I'm curious how much world building goes into um, doing all of these these works, you have multiple kind of worlds at any time. What kind of work do you do, or do you, do you just start writing, or do you do you plan a world, or does it come to you? Can you talk a little bit about how that happens, Chris? Um, yeah, you know, for me, it's very different depending on 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 what I'm working on. So, you know, in Red Hands, the world building really is about um, creating the fictional governmental agencies within the you know, real governmental agencies, um, you know, and then finding the sweet spot between, you know, between research and invention, you know, uh, between actual history and actual archaeology and the mythology and supernatural stuff. And so to me, that's the world building that goes into this stuff. The larger world building is in stuff like, um, you know, Mike Mignola and I have created these comic book characters and series that are collectively called the Outerverse, um, Baltimore and Joe Golem, a cult detective. And they just solicited Lady Baltimore number one, and there's more to come beyond that. And um, and that world is huge. I mean, it is huge and well-defined, and it's taken all the years that we've been doing these comics. We've been expanding that world and defining it and explaining, you know, 
in Baltimore, the second miniseries of Baltimore, the Curse Bells, uh, during World War One or just after World War One, we killed the young Adolf Hitler. But in Lady Baltimore number one, we're beginning World War Two, and Hitler Hitler died back in Baltimore. So. How does that affect the world? How, how does that change things? How do the characters in Joe Golem in 1965 or 1975 connect? You know, what's the through line? And that has been one of the greatest creative pleasures of my life. Cool. Yeah, for me, world building is 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 key, but it depends on the story too. Like I'm I'm writing my first epic fantasy novel right now, so there's a ton of world building in that. I've never written an epic fantasy piece longer than a short story and you know th th this is going to be the start of a new series so i've got a ton of world building to do not only for this book but to to lay the groundwork for future books so i'm doing it you know more there for something like ink though um the world was pretty well established in my first three novels but i don't expect readers of ink to have um read those books i don't require that so what i've done instead is i, I reread them and i i Try to capture the feeling of the town as a character, and and so when in ink that was a, a key a thing for me to uh, that my world building was really viewed through the lens of the town and its 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 personality its complexities. The more I I, I did that, the more not only did it supported the actual story you know in terms of mood and tone, but it gives a sense of place that you know people will know hopefully know the town. Once they've read the story, that you know they, they could could probably even find where a couple of the landmarks are because it, it's a simple layout of the town, and the town has a voice, has a presence, has a personality, and and I love doing that for, uh, um, you know, for any kind of a story, for any kind of world building. Fascinating. Um, when when you're writing multiple stories in these places and and multiple books in a series, how do you keep it fresh for the reader and for yourself? Uh, well, um, it's really not about the place. It's not about the series. It's about what the characters are going through in any given moment. Uh, you know, when you look at someone's life, um, they have these these big events that that are like landmarks throughout their lives. They're mile markers. Our novels are essentially focusing on those mile marker moments. Um, but you know, we write as if the character has lived before and will live after this story. Well, hopefully after the story, depending on the character. <laughs> uh, so. Um, it, it stays fresh because the character in the next book isn't exactly the same as the character in the last book. Like my Joe Ledger thriller series, I'm, I'm, I'll be starting the 13th in that series pretty soon. And, um, you know, the character is vastly different in the, in the one I just turned in in Relentless than he was in Patient Zero. There is a clear arc. And that's that's our responsibility as writers to make sure the character is evolving. The last thing in the world you would want is for someone to pick up you know, book seven and and see that the character hasn't changed at all since book one. They used to do that back in the 50s and 60s. You know, some of the uh, um, the, the Spencer novels and James uh, Bond novels, some of, some of them he didn't grow, the character didn't grow as much because the publisher wanted it to be timeless. Now we're, we're seeing things in a little more organic way. And I think a lot of it has to do with television. We've seen characters age and change within series, you know, years of series. Once they started doing... Um, seasons that had an arc rather than just individual episodes. Mm -hmm. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example. I mean, those characters grew constantly throughout the series. Well, you know, you couldn't tell, um, you couldn't take uh, the Buffy from season one and put her in an episode uh, of season six, the character would be killed. The right. character wouldn't survive that level of threat. The character is able to deal with the stuff that comes later because of the things they've gone through. And that's what keeps it fresh for us. We are evolving the characters and aware of the, and being aware of those changes as as the chronicler of those characters. Yeah, and, and again, it's funny. I, while you were speaking, before you mentioned Buffy, that was the thing that popped into my head because I always try to explain to people there are lots of reasons why that show was a turning point. Uh, the others have been covered ad nauseum, but that that's a thing that I don't think people appreciate enough, which is that. Um, that was a series where no matter what happened, the events had consequences. The characters were changed by them irrevocably. And that was a thing that wasn't that common. You know, it wasn't really a common thing. And so uh, I feel the same way about uh, 
you know, Ben Walker's changing from book to book and other characters I've done. I did uh, 10 books in my young adult thriller series, Body of Evidence. Um, and, you know, Jenna Blake changes from book to book. And you're right. You mentioned Spencer. I love those books. I love that character. But the point of characters like Spencer was, at least for in the early days, the point of those characters is to sort of be so competent that they skate along the surface of whatever the uh, problem is that they're supposed to fix. Um, and, you know, he might go through issues with his girlfriend, but the, the events are not necessarily changing him. Right. And uh, I think it's for the better when, as much as I enjoy those books, I think it's for the better when characters do have uh, uh, the events have an impact and change the characters you know yeah one of my favorite writers and is a friend of ours who uh, does that really well is joe lansdale his oh, happen oh, yeah. characters have evolved so beautifully over the series of books that it's i mean i don't even I, I i sometimes can't remember what the plot of an individual book was but i remember what happened to the characters and, and, and you don't need to remember the plot <laughs> and by the way speaking of meta characters coming from other stories um Joe Joe gave me a, a enthusiastic green light to put Happen Leonard in my latest Joe Ledger novel. Oh, so wow. they, they, fantastic. There's, there's a couple of chapters with them in it. It's a lot of fun to write. Oh, wow. Oh God, that's that's cool. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you look at Happen Leonard and and their their relationship has just deepened. And here's the other thing. They've gotten old. Right. You know, and this is, you read, if you read, uh, the Dave Robichaud novels by James Lee Burke, and I've read every single one of them. It's one of the one of the greatest accomplishments yeah. uh, in genre fiction is that series. Talk about an evolution of character, not just him, but but Cleet and all the other characters, um, and and they're characters who got old. Yeah, um, and I I just love it. I think it's fantastic. And there's a cost to the characters for getting old or getting injured yeah. or changing. And that is great dramatic potential. See, some writers are afraid to to do the extra work to make a character much more complex. But then you have the writers, you know, Chris and I, Lansdale, Burke. There's a, there's a bunch of writers who actually, that's what makes it fun. Being able to go in there and constantly work with someone. It's like chronicling a real person's life. Like, what happened to you since the last time we did a story? Oh, crap. Now I got to work that in? All right. That could be cool. You know. Right. Well, that's it's really interesting, too, because... On this note, um, I made a weird choice with Red Hands, which is, you know, the first two books, uh, this is sort of related to your question too, John, you know, the first two books uh, have a lot of similarities. And Red Hands, I purposely, you know, I really wanted to change locations, make it take place in the United States. I wanted a smaller cast, um, sort of smaller stakes, I guess you'd say. And then uh, the focus on Walker as a father and and how he's reflect he's seeing the father and child relationships and the people around him and how he makes him reflect on his own relationship with his son and so that and this is a spoiler sort of but not really is that you know the the book does wrap up and unlike the first two books the thing that's left dangling the cliffhanger is a personal one it's about personal stakes more more than the supernatural thriller stakes you know um and that was a, a choice very much in line with the conversation we're having. Yeah. Speaking of choices, um, how much of a choice do you, I, I, I imagine you, you kind of have a semi plan where you're going into a continuing thing, like where it's going to go. Um, but I imagine also there's a lot of surprises along the way. Is, is that what, is that the case as you're writing? Sure. As a character, as characters evolve, you know, as you write them, if you're writing with you know real passion, the characters become real people and they become much more complex. Um, so, and there's a lot of surprises. A good example of surprises, um, when I was writing my my first YA novel, Rotten Ruin, there was a character named Nix who was a, a hometown girl he knew, uh, the main character knew, and she was only ever intended to be in one scene. She was just the girl who liked him in school. He liked her, but because they knew each other, he didn't want to get in a relationship because he couldn't be the mysterious guy, you know, typical macho stuff. Um, but when I wrote the first scene, that, that solo scene with her, she became f far more interesting. And I went up putting her in another scene, another. And then I realized I had to go back and restructure my entire plot because she, clearly she was the co-star of the series. And all the way up to book seven, which just came out, 
she grew in in um, in her scope and her complexity, and that sort of stuff surprises me. But it's it's a kind of a it's weird. It's a surprise, but we hope to be surprised by that. We hope the characters become so real, so fully nuanced that they then tell us that we're not writing them deeply enough. So we have to carve another layer out and go deeper. Man, that that's what makes writing so much fun. Yeah, it happens. It happens in in small ways constantly, and occasionally it happens in a big way. It happened in the book that I just finished, um, which is coming out in like I winter spring twenty two, um, which is called Road of Bones, and I'm not going to go into it, but it happened there in a big way. But I also I did this trilogy, uh, sort of dark fantasy trilogy called the Veil Trilogy. The first book is the Myth Hunters. And, and the crazy thing with that is I have these two characters and they're wandering in the forest. And out of nowhere, as I'm writing about them wandering in the forest, I start to describe how they feel like they're being watched, like they're being followed. It wasn't in the outline. I just, I was like, oh, this adds to the creepy factor. And I kept bringing it up in this chapter. And then uh, literally like as I'm typing, I type that this the, that this woman emerges from the woods, and she's Kitsune, the Japanese fox spirit, um, and she's a trickster. She shows up, completely invented in that moment, like from from like fingers to keyboard, whatever, not part of the story at all, and becomes immediately a massive part of the entire trilogy. Um, and that's and great. That's great. Like, stuff like, like that is fantastic. fantastic. That's but cool. You could, feel, you could feel the importance of it, you know? It's yeah. like they kind of insisted on being born <laughs> on the page. Um, do you, on the flip side, do you ever do any kind of like serious character development? Like, um, I have an acting background. So I always kind of do like the 50 questions when I'm developing characters and I do a lot of work like that. But like you said, sometimes I don't, but do, do you ever do like more uh, extensive character development? Um, I, well, I, I plot my novels out and my novel plots tend to be about the character's experience, how the, how the plot is, is impacting them. I'm, I'm not one of the, even though I do high concept fiction, especially my Joe Ledger stuff, my plot is less about the high concept. I mean, I, I handle that with my research. And I, that's the story. That's a scaffolding, but um, the plot itself is all about what happens to the characters. So I'm always doing the character development. That to me, that is what the story is about. I mean, Ink is is all about the experience of characters in an extraordinary circumstance, and because they are more important than anything else, I w I was able to comfortably dedicate big chunks of the story to building them, to making them as interesting as possible, and um, you know. Tying back to a previous question, the character of Monk Addison, who's the star of this book, actually he and the tattoo artist Patty were in a previous novel of mine. They were in the novel Glimpse, but as supporting characters. And the, they, they, they actually were um, appealing enough that producers optioned Glimpse just to get Monk Addison. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, I, I was already planning to write another uh, another story with Monk, and they're like, "We need more about this character. Can can you you know you know give us more?" But I was already going there. You know, I was already wanting want to do more with the character. But if I do another novel with Monk, he might be a supporting character again. You know, uh, it depends on what what the needs of the story are and what which characters are speaking inside my head in the loudest and most compelling voices. Interesting. Yep. I'm with you. Um, I, I lost track. I was listening to your answer and I lost track of the question. What was, I was, just asking, what was that? How, how far is up? That's the question. <laughs> I was just asking about if you do any like a char uh, extensive character. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. um, sometimes I do, sometimes I scribble notes and I have done that, uh, you know, and I do when I've, I've, I've done lectures and I, uh, about you know creating a character window for, you know uh to get to know the character better but most of my work in that is the process of discovery it's coming out while i'm writing very sort of instinctively and then a lot of times also for me both plot and character are things that hit me um you know halfway through the book i'll uh, you know i'll be in the shower and i'll be out for a walk and i'll be like oh i understand this character now in a way that I 
didn't. And, uh, and, it, and it connects with all the things I've written about the character already. But all of a sudden, I'll have an epiphany about the character and, and how to make that richer, how to make their experiences that I've even mentioned connect more to the story thematically. And then plot wise, that always happens is like, oh, my God, I, I understand what this book is about. What am I what am I really I know what the story is, but I finally understand what the book is about. And all of a sudden it just connects and the tissues all there. And that's the you know, those are the moments that are make it all worthwhile. That's so awesome. Um, and, and piggybacking on that, um, in, in the back of Ink, there's an amazing, um, very detailed uh, uh, playlist for Patty. Um, do you listen to that music while you're writing? We, did you have that cranking up while you're, you know, writing the book? Uh, yeah, I, well, I listen to music all the time when I write. Um, different types of music for different things, like acoustic jazz when I'm editing and, you know, and so on. But, when I, but each book does have a, a certain personality. And for the last couple of years, I've been asking my, my uh, uh, readers on, on uh, social media to help me build a playlist for each book. And uh, they've started appearing in each book. My new Joe Ledger novel will have a playlist. It's probably even going to be one of my epic fa fantasy novel though, with a heavy bias toward heavy metal, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I, I, I do make the playlists uh, on my iPad and I do listen to them. And uh, uh, you you know, the songs that the people recommend that I pick to include in the playlist, each one ha touches on some note that I have in my plot. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's fun to do, you know, it's especially when, like, I just recently got the copy edit manuscript, meaning that the, the manuscript came back with all the line edits from uh, uh, the publishing house. And uh, by, by putting on my playlist and pouring a large cup of coffee, uh, <laughs> I got really back into the mood of it right away because those songs triggered memories from the actual process of writing. So, yeah, they're very useful. And they're also a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I have to say, for me, I don't have Jonathan's time, apparently. I, mean, I don't know I don't know a busier guy on earth than Jonathan Mayberry, and somehow he's got time to do that. So I don't understand that. But um, I do go through musical phases, uh, depending on what I'm... So I can say, like, you know, when I was writing uh, Red Hands, I was listening almost entirely to Frank Turner and The Cure. Wow. Um, for whatever reason, those were the two things that were, you know, I listen to other things all the time, but to have on in the background while I'm writing, those were the things that were in my brain. And Road of Bones, which is the one I just finished, I literally listened to, I would say 90% of that book was written to Bruce Springsteen. Oh, wow. Uh, which is weird because it's set in Siberia. <laughs> but but Springsteen actually comes up as a significant point in the book. So wow. Uh, but it's weird because it's not, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, Siberia, Bruce Springsteen have nothing in common. But for some reason, I think it was just the um, uh, the the humanness and the sort of uh, rusty quality um, of of Springsteen songs. You know, the pe the way that people live. Uh, in Siberia, and and the way that Springs the, the people that Springsteen often sings about live are not that different. And right. I think in my brain it was like I wanted the heartache that comes from his music. You know. You know. Did, yeah. did you have you seen? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, for my first novel, Ghost Road Blues, it was uh, Tom Waits was my co-pilot the entire time. Um, and uh, sometimes there is a singer who who is has been whispering to you for a long time. And you know your your Springsteen, my time waits. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, did you see the film Blinded by the Light? Loved it. Yeah, yeah. you kind kind of reminded me like the, the Siberian uh, connection. It doesn't seem yeah, yeah. connected, but there's that human thing. And speaking of an artist that's growing old with his audience and doing it gracefully and beautifully, yeah. um, his book and the last two albums he've done, he's done yeah. or have just been really like beautiful, like examples of what what you were mentioning, like where all his characters and him as a character has evolved along with his audience. And it's just so fascinating to see. And it's comforting in a very, very weird and kind of melancholy way. Yeah. It's, it's comforting in the sense. And again, you're right. It goes back to what I was saying about James Lee Burke writing about Dave Robichaux and Cleet Purcell getting old. I mean, um, it's comforting in the sense that Springsteen isn't trying to write the songs that Springsteen at 22 would have written. Right. 
you know, he's not, he, he's, he's not writing about that experience anymore. And um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that he's allowing himself to have the, the perspective that a man of his age has. Yep. Yeah, it's really it's really inspiring and, and and fascinating to to check that out. It's just just awesome. Um, real quick, um, Jonathan, I think you blew up the uh, the thing tonight when when you mentioned Happen Letter. Um, somebody wrote "Holy shit," and then somebody wrote "Sweet Crossover." <laughs> so uh, very exciting. I'm sure people are going to be psyched. <laughs> yeah, and, and Joe Lansdale. If you guys haven't read Joe Lansdale, go read Joe Lansdale. I mean. Oh. Whether whether you like mystery, western, horror, whatever, I don't think there's a genre that that guy hasn't touched yet. He could do a cookbook, and it would be compelling. Yeah, and, yeah. and funny. Yeah, I, no, I, I um, I just read the Elephant of Surprise. I'm a little behind. <laughs> I'm two books behind. I've got them here. One of my favorite titles, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 that's the thing, man, about Joe. Um, in fact, um. I think we talked about this on Twitter, so it's not a secret, but um, Brian Keene and I and Joe are editing an anthology of short stories set in the world of the drive-in. Oh, man. Um, and uh, and we just got our first story. Actually, the, the second one came last night. Um, the first story is by Stephen Graham Jones that, that oh. came in. Oh. And yes. it's so great. And it's it, the cool thing about it is like, Joe's such a generous person as a human, as a writer. And, um, and Stephen hits his note perfect. Like, I feel like, like I'm glad I'm not writing a story for the anthology because if I had and I'd read Stephen's story, I'd be like, no, nope, screw this. Not even going to try. <laughs> but, but Joe has this ability to be, um, he has this ability to be funny and grim uh, or not grim, grave, funny and grave about the human condition simultaneously. Yep. And that way that sort of takes on board everything that we're experiencing in life and what it all means and doesn't mean and all that kind of stuff and how bittersweet it all is and really process it in a way that's constantly entertaining, um, but never a downer. You know, I just, I, I don't know. He's, he's the best there is. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Yeah, I love them. Um, definitely a, a big favor. I just got of Mice and Minestrone uh, this week. So <laughs> always, I know he's the best titles. You yeah. just you just laugh when you see him um, in a good way. You know, I, I, yeah, of course. And and speaking of Joe, I think Joe does something that's a really important thing for for writers to to um, examine. And I think that's voice. And I get a lot of questions. People say, well. You know, how does Twilight sell a million copies and the writing sucks, this, that, and the other thing? And I always think that it's it's more about the the author's voice that connects with people. Uh, what do you think makes good writing? What, how do you think a writer would get to that? Authenticity. It's also authenticity. I mean, if you're trying – a lot of people make the mistake, when, especially when they're breaking in, of trying to write like their favorite writers. You know, yes, I would love to write as well as James Lee Burke. I don't write as well. I, I, I write – even if I wrote something that would make me as successful as him, he's one of the, the top writers you know, of our age, I'm still not going to write like James Lee Burke, nor should I aspire to that, nor should I aspire to write like Stephen King or something else. You know, When you find out what your voice is, the voice that tells the story you would be the fan of. The one, you know, when I was a kid, Ray Bradbury told me that, that you should go out, you know, write the book. You would not only read, but go out of your way to hunt down and read write that book. Well, that's, that's authenticity, you know, and you have to noodle around and play with it to find out what your voice really is. And then once you find out what your voice is, you have to find out what the voice of the story is. I mean, the voice of, of ink is a completely different voice than the voice of say glimpse, even though there are some characters in both books, there are different voices than rotten ruin, different voices than Mars one, different voices than the X-Files novel I wrote. Every book has its own voice. And if you, are honest with yourself at the beginning and and try to write in your own voice that clears away a lot of the clutter of being able to identify what the the, the story's voice is because again you're not trying to fake it you're not trying to pull a hustle and do somebody else's voice on top of your plot yeah and again the only thing i would add to that jonathan is that for me i, I don't look it will come as no surprise to the people who know me 
I don't consider myself a sophisticated enough writer to spend a lot of time developing, like willfully, purposefully sitting down and developing what I think my voice is. But I've been telling people stories my whole life. Before I ever wrote a story down, I've been telling people stories my whole life. And I feel like it has taken me a long time to fig to stop trying to resist the urge to just tell it like I would tell it. And so I've gotten to the point now where, and I think you can find this in, in places like Red Hands and, and Ararat, that like I'm telling you the story the way I would tell you the story. Um, now that it gets different in other places, when I wrote Baltimore, the novel, you know, because of what it is, it's, it's got certain manners and a certain style of, uh, of storytelling that matches the tone of what the story is. That's different. But when it's, uh, you know, sort of one of these novels that are, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out there that are contemporary books, et cetera, it really is just a matter of me, you know, like I'm sitting down and telling you, John, this is the story. This is what happened. Um, and it took me a while to get comfortable with allowing myself to do that. Uh, and it's made me so much happier as a storyteller. Wow. That's really interesting. And I, I think that, that it, you know, that's really what um, is, is what readers really want. They, they want just a, a storyteller and, and, regardless of where your voice lands, I think that's, it connects with people in a certain way. And I think that's really um, an important facet. And it reminds me a lot of, you know, when you're when, like what Jonathan said with um, working through stories and not, not doing other people's stories. Like if you're a musician, you, you learn a lot of covers, you learn a lot of scales, you learn to play like Eddie Van Halen for a little bit. And then from that, you, you develop your own things. You take what, what works for you and you write your own songs. And the first ones might sound like some of the covers, but then you find your own voice. And I think that's true of any of the creative arts. Um, and where you land with that, I think, is is what people will, will respond to. There's, I think there's some magic between the words. Um, and I think, you know, when I when I read, uh, you know, Jonathan's books, I can hear him talking sometimes. And same with you, Chris. And, and you know, or Joe Lansdale, of course, you know, if you've ever seen him read and you read his books, you're like, you can hear his voice. So it, it's, you know, when you can when you can meld those two together, I think you're you're really onto something. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of questions. Do, should we, should we take some questions? For sure. Them? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Um, okay. Um, this one's again from Joel. Um, Jonathan, what's your view on the level of violence in YA novels? Is it the same as your adult novels? And do you think teenagers are looking for more violence? <laughs> well, I, I, I actually don't know or and don't really care whether teenagers want more violence. The violent level of violence in any of my stories is, is, appropriate to what's going on in the stories. I'm probably a little less likely to paint blood on the walls in a YA than in a Joe Ledger thriller, but not that much less. I mean, in my Rotten Ruin series, there's a whole lot of violence in that series, but the, the, the main thing is the violence is never the point of the story. I'm not writing to, to satisfy a desire for violence. I'm writing a story about people living in a violent world. You know, I grew up in a very, very tough neighborhood in, in Philadelphia in a very violent household. My father was an abuser. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we saw violence all the time. I mean, it was part of our lives growing up. Um, so I don't write stories uh, to reflect a world where, you know, oh, violence never happens to kids. Kids are fine. They have, all have loving parents and everything's wonderful. And your pets never grow old and die. No, I, you know, I, I don't write those kind of stories because that's not my experience. I write stories in which the characters are pitted against um, increasingly difficult odds and keep having to level up in order to deal with it so that they don't ask for help or they don't get help. They, they learn how to solve it. And, um, you know, sometimes that does involve violence and sometimes it doesn't involve violence. There are you know, not every, every challenge in my, my YA fiction um, is resolved with, a, with violence. In fact, not even a third of them. Um, Violence happens, of course, in the big dramatic finales and so on. But a lot of there's other types of problem solving that, that, that happens during the story. And that problem solving is more of the point, not whether it's a violent problem solving or a logic puzzle or something else. You know, it's the characters and what they need and what the, what I you know, put them through in order to let them grow. 
Chris, you want to talk? Yeah. Well, about I mean, that was a that was a Jonathan question, I guess. But the <laughs> the only thing that I would add to it is, uh, you know, years ago in a, in a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel, I I wrote the line, um, "A hero is someone who does what must be done and needs no other reason." Mm -hmm. um, and I I still believe that. But the what you were talking about, Jonathan, is that first part. You know, it does what must be done. You know, and it's so I'm not. I certainly don't, uh, you know, I, I never shied away from violence in, in when I was writing YA novels, um, but it always had a reason. It always had a purpose. It was always required for the character to uh, to do whatever violent act was done um, in order to stop worse from happening. Yeah. Cool. I like this next question from Dennis Crosby. Um, he asks, I know a number of writers that have found it difficult to create during the pandemic. It's been hard on a lot of people. What's kept you guys going? Um, huh. Well, you know, early in the year when, when COVID first hit, I went through a bit of the, the COVID malaise too. I would hmm. spend whole days and get only a few words done because the world seemed to have stopped. And I, I guess on some level, I thought publishing was going to stop. It turns out publishing is actually not stopping at all. People need to be entertained during isolation. Um, but the world changed um, during it. And there, there's a feeling of being, you know, cut loose of your moorings during it. It took a while to get back in groove. But that said, once I got back in groove, you know, I, I remembered the way I, I started being a professional writer in the first place. I would get up take a shower, get dressed for work. So yes, this is what I, I got dressed for work. I could be writing in a tank top and, and, and short and boxer shorts, but that isn't my, what I wear to work. So by, by dressing for work, by setting a schedule, I was able to get back into the feel of being a writer, even though the world was taking, you know, holding its breath for month after month. And, um, once that, once I started doing that, started following following my old habits of how to be a professional writer, not only did I get back into gear, I mean, this has turned out to be the most productive year of my career. I've written four and a quarter novels already this year. Whoa. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dude, it, it's gonna, I'm going to close out the year at around 700,000 words for publication between novels, comics, short stories, essays, and articles. So... Um, but the thing is, you know, social isolation, I can write 12 hours a day too, because I don't have to travel and go to conventions. Um, right. so it, it, I, I, I wound up leveling up a little bit. And by the way, Chris, wow. I'm, I'm the fourth fastest writer I know. So Kevin Anderson has written a novel while we're having this conversation. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I, we have to check in with Kevin to see if he managed 700,000 words this year. I've written this year, uh, I've written one novel, uh, and it's my shortest novel ever. Hmm. Uh, I have written a ton of comic books this year, um, but nowhere near the word count you're talking about, and a couple short stories and a novella. That's that's my the sum total of 2020. I think also, you know, I've done other stuff also, projects I'm not supposed to talk about, but, you know, I think for me, John, the answer to the question is that um, the combination of American politics and COVID um, and the way that American politics has cost us so many lives with COVID mm -hmm. um, uh, has been so debilitating. And so um, while it, I never stopped working, I was when Dark Horse Comics said pens, you know, pens and pencils down uh, for two months uh that was actually good for me because i was a little behind and that helped me but um i feel like uh i never stopped working but the output the sort of daily output was lower it took me a long a longer time it took me more runway to take off on any given day weirdly by and large all year i've been happier with the work i did hmm. um so more satisfied with the with the outcome of the work I'm doing, but the the daily word count was lower. Um, so it's been interesting, you know. Cool. Um, that's really. But it's I can't seven... wait to be over. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's, like 
Yeah. If even if it means Jonathan only does six hundred thousand words next right. year, <laughs> I'm hoping to do less, do fewer. <laughs> and it, it it is looking good though. The first vaccines are coming in. Um, I think yeah. what did we get a million in California here this week that that arrived? So, yeah. fingers crossed, and we can you know all see each other in person again soon. Not that I don't love this. This is amazing, but yeah, but I, I do love the conventions and the, and hanging out with my buddies. I miss sure. hanging out with Chris and the rest of the crowd at Dragon Con at the Weston bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, that was tough for sure. Um, we have one other question here from, um, Eric Nanali. Um, Nanali, thank you. No <laughs> This is for both of you. It says you've both written a volume of work from novels to comics and more. What was the last thing you wrote? Any genre or media that you think really challenged your typical approach and helps you grow as an author? Chris? <laughs> I mean, a, a couple of things. Um, I did do the, uh, I did the pilot and Bible for a potential TV series based on the Ben Walker character. And oh. um, that was such a fantastic process. Um, the collaborative process, the input that I got from the people involved was really helpful. Um, it, it made me really think about the structure of a television series and um, forced me to sort of, by answering their questions, to teach myself uh, you know, a lot more about television structure, not, not just episode, but season structure and things like that. So that was good. Um, and then I would say also, again, back to uh, Road of Bones, um, uh, it was a serious challenge to me because with the three Ben Walker novels, I've been, uh, the temptation to just go big um, has been so great and I haven't needed to rein myself in. Um, and I had to fight on Road of Bones because I kept, you know, second guessing myself. This is too short. It's too simple. It's too small. And I kept going, no, no, this is, you know, and it was, a, so it was a challenge to sort of control the, the urge that I had or the doubt that I had. Um, and, you know. Now I'm, it's funny. My, my most recent big challenge is also doing a novel and a, and a TV series Bible. Um, can't say what it's based on yet because it's non-disclosure agreement, but it's a you know prequel to a science fiction movie from a few years ago that they're thinking of expanding into a, a series. I wrote a novel for it, and then they asked me to write this this series Bible. And um, I hadn't done that before. I had to learn the form. And that's that's one of the the fun things about the writing biz. If a new form of writing comes up, a new opportunity comes up, you know, instead of saying no, we 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 learn to to we learn the form, you know, whether it's short stories or YA or middle grade or, you know, comics, whatever. So I had to learn the form for writing a series Bible. And that was a lot of fun. And it made me want to go back and change some things in the novel that I had just written. <laughs> because now I, I, see, you know, I need to lay the groundwork for, you know, possibly years of, of television where there might be anywhere from, you know, eight to 14 episodes per season. Uh, I, I want to lay the groundwork early on in that, but without, just making the novel a, a setup for that. So you had to find that balance because you, you don't want to, to do anything as, as cheap as, as say, you know, this is just a, a pilot. It's not, it should be a novel. It should have all the meat on its bones. So that was a real challenge for me. And I loved it. I absolutely loved that challenge. Cool. Great question. Great answers. Um, Joel is back. Uh, oh, um, somebody wrote, this is funny. H. Scott Cottingham asked Jonathan, did you invent the pandemic to increase your productivity? <laughs> uh, no, I would have I would have had zombies in mind. Yeah. <laughs> that prepared for the zombie thing. Pretty well prepared. Right. Definitely. Um, I know we're running a little bit out of time here. Um, a big question I had for both of you is how do you define success today as a writer for you for you personally? Chris. <laughs> I'm paying my bills, John. Nice. <laughs> no, it. I mean, that's the, you know, uh, I'm paying my bills. My family, knock on wood, everybody's healthy. Everybody's happy. What else is there? Yeah, that, that, that's a big part of it right there. Um, yeah. The other part is, you know, just the, the, the whole thing about living the dream. 
Um, you know, we get to make stuff up for a living and get paid for it. We are professional daydreamers. That's pretty friggin' great job description. Um, so, you know, my measure of success is when I was when I got to the point where I I could do this for a living. That's that was genuine happiness, and it has not become a whit less happy. In fact, any if anything else, I'm you know. I, I, I keep getting happier because the, the more the business changes, the more opportunities come up. They don't always pan out, but at least it's not the same thing every single day. If I was working in, you know, digging ditches or when I, back when I was a bodyguard, where basically, you know, who'd you beat up today? You know, it's it's the same basic idea. Now it's different every day. Even though we're sitting at a, at a computer writing every day, we're not writing the same words every day. There's always something new to learn, something new to do. So. Yeah, I mean, again, in 2020, I've had opportunities to do half a dozen things I had never done before. Um, you know, I'm working on a project with Amber Benson that I can't really talk about. And we just delivered the sort of treatment for this project. It's freaking 20,000 words, wow. and, you know, because we're just inventing. And, and it's a very different kind of format and everything. And it's great. I guess the other thing I want to say about success, though, is, and I've told this story before, um, and I really hope that uh, other writers will will pay attention to it. A number of years ago, after the Baltimore novel came out, Mike Mignola and I optioned it to New Regency, which was part of Fox at the time, and we were hired to write the screenplay, um, and uh, which meant mostly brainstorming it together and me doing the actual writing. And that's not a, you know, that's the way that uh, Mike and I work on a lot of that stuff. Um, and my wife bought a bottle of champagne. We had family coming over that night, the day that I signed the contract, because it was a, a film deal. And it was the first time I was going to be paid to write a screenplay. I was going to become a member of the WGA, all of that. And she bought the champagne and people coming over and I got very uptight. I was like, no, I don't want to celebrate. We'll celebrate when the movie comes out. And of course, there was never a movie. And it took me years to understand that and to really regret it. I regret that. And so now I try to celebrate uh, every victory because that was a huge deal. Yeah. That was like a big deal. It was a victory. I wrote a screenplay for a major Hollywood studio based on a novel that I'd written. Um, and you know, we should have celebrated and I was stupid not to. So I just encourage everybody to celebrate every time, every tiny milestone um, because it's all success. It's all yeah. victory. You know, next time I see you, we're going to have some champagne. All right. Sounds yeah. Good. yeah. I love it. Um, looks like we have to wrap up pretty soon. So um, just want to know what, what do you guys have next that you can talk about? And where can people find you? <laughs> uh, my, I, I can be found all over the all over the net. You know, just spell my last name the right way. It's M A B E R O Y. So Jonathan Mayberry, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, website, you know, dot com. And for the writers out there, there's a page on my website. Free stuff for writers. Go there. But things that I can talk about. Um, I'm writing my first epic fantasy, Eight Keg and the Dam, which should be out the end of of 2021. Um, I'm doing a graphic novel for DC that I can't tell you about, but we'll be making an announcement about that kind of, kind of soon. And, um, my Bewilderness series is, is being, you know, released on, on Audible and it's a novel broken into three sections being released on Audible first parts out. And if you're an Audible subscriber, it's free. So there are three 30,000 word novellas that, 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 you know, become one big story. First parts out now, second part will be out. January 7th, third part, third part, February 4th, read by Shana Small. They're all free. Go grab them. Enjoy a, you know, a, a fun, weird science fiction read by a great, great actor. Um, for me, it's very simple. Red Hands was out last <laughs> week, last Tuesday. Uh, that's available now. The next one is Road of Bones, not a Ben Walker novel. That'll be out in early 22. Uh, and in between times, uh, there are lots and lots of comics coming from Dark Horse from me and Mike Mignola. The first of which is Lady Baltimore number one, which will be out in March. March, cool. Is that a limited series? Lady, Lady, it's Lady Baltimore, the Witch Queens number one. So it's a five issue miniseries. 
uh, laying the groundwork for other stuff that I can't talk about. Cool. All right. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to say before we sign off? Or? Just to thank you and Alex and Westport Library. Yeah. 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 Westport Likewise. Thanks, Likewise. Oh, here's Stay Alex. Happy. Yeah. All right. Thank the, the three of you. Thank you so much. This was so great. It was so insightful. And like everybody watching, you all just got a free masterclass tonight. So, so thank you for being here. Um, there are links to buy ink and red hands in the, uh, in the chat. We, the uh, Jonathan and Chris were, were nice enough to, to sign book plates for us. So uh, click the links, buy the books, get them signed. Um, John, thanks, John. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, if you want to check out John's work, my favorite is Ghost Heart, but check his website. Uh, I recommend Ghost Heart. Also, while I'm throwing stuff out there, this book is so great. Uh, Don't Turn Out the Lights, presented by the HWA. Jonathan and Chris are in it. It's awesome. If Just go buy this. And Eric Nunnally is in the, the, the chat tonight. Go buy Lightning Wears a Red Cape, because that book is badass, too. Um, right. John, Jonathan, and Chris. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This was so great. I hope everybody has happy holidays. Hope the snow stops. <laughs> and I hope the weather, I mean, I don't want it to dip below 55 for you guys. So you and John. <laughs> and wear, wear your mask. Wear your mask. Yes. Wear your yeah, mask. Mask up, everybody. That All right. Everybody out there. Is, but... Thanks Bye. for being Thanks. here. Stay Great safe. Guys. Thanks. Be well, everyone. You too.